The top 10 running backs, those are easy. Those are obvious. It's the it's the running backs we're talking about on today's episode that are really going to help make or break your draft. Make sure you don't get the wrong ones. Pay attention. Leave a comment on who your favorite is or where we are wrong. Like, subscribe, and enjoy the show. All right, all right, all right. It's almost that time of year. The time when I set the foundation for supreme and total dominance at my fantasy football draft. How can I be so confident? Because I used the ultimate draft kit from the fantasy footballers. Man, it updates all off season, so I never worry about using old busted information. Consistency charts, auction values, full projections. Oh baby, this thing's got it all. You want to keep it 100 for your draft? Head to ultimatedraftkit.com and get your copy today. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah. <laughs> ah. Welcome in one and all Wednesday, August 10th. Hot off the heels of watching Dan Campbell explain to people there's like guys on the beach, some are in the shores, some are in the water. The I, shallows. Yeah, they're in the shallows, Mike. I had no idea what that guy was talking about, but it was provocative. Uh, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, Jason Moore, Mike Wright, Andy Holloway, back with you, Running Back Rankings Part 2. Hard Knocks did debut last night. That is what Mike is referring to. The Dan Campbell Show. I have always, and this is just how I think about these things, uh, every year. Slash Jamal Williams. Okay. I mean, every year there is a team featured on Hard Knocks, and we've been through a number of them over the years, and I have always, my brain went to, it goes straight to this. Like if I, I pretend I, if I was the coach of the team being featured on hard knocks, mm -hmm. when we see that opening camp speech from the head coach, I want to know if it's them or if they are thinking about what they're um, saying because they're going to be on hard knocks. Am I getting both. the real Gruden slash, you know, who, who did we have? Jeff Fisher. Uh, I'm not going seven and nine. But Bill O'Brien. I mean, I, I I think we got the real Dan Campbell. I mean, look, it's definitely got to be in your head. I think it's especially with that one because you know that that's the cold open to the show. It just it's you giving the big introduction to to camp. Once they're on the field and you you're in it, I think you forget the cameras are there more so at that point. But like he is, he is a jacked up high T version of the dude from the big Lebowski, like every, everything ends with the word man. And I love it. It's so much fun. Imagining like put the sweater. If you get the big Lebowski sweater on him, it, it would be him identically. And, and Fookland, if you are uh, unfamiliar with our nickname of guns, Mahoney, ah, that, yes. this started back when he was the temporary head coach of the Miami dolphins and no one could remember his name, right? We couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't remember his name, but we, we knew how jacked up he was. We're like, you know, guns, Mahoney there. Well, he is, uh, he is prime time guns, Mahoney now. Yeah. He's a big, he's a big man doing up downs with the team, you know? I would have tapped out at about seven of those. Yeah, that those looked brutal, and he was doing them a lot better than the, the, oh, dude, the players. There was dude, one player just I, totally falling on the ground. Not I was even. hoping that you guys saw that. I I can't. I was like fifty-seven. I don't remember the number, but that guy was just throwing his body on the ground, no resistance at all, just pl plant push up. He was doing cheap up downs <laughs> and hoping no one saw him, which the coach couldn't see him because he was doing up downs. All right. Uh, we will be back into running back rankings today. Did the top 10 on yesterday's show. Like I said, I've got some news to talk about. The fantasy football community, jointhefoot.com, bonus weekly shows, tons of premium in-season perks. Bonus. You get access to all the Discord channels. You get access to a number of uh, ways to find league mates. It's, it's the community. Absolutely. It's the people that listen. And speaking of Discord, Papa Josh ran a, uh, a football television trivia 
show on on the Discord last night. Jumped in there, a few of us did, and it was it was a lot of fun. Man, the Discord was popping. Said it at the top. I mean, a friend did. Uh, UltimateDraftKid dot com. <laughs> Great friend. You owe your fantasy season the udk because the draft is how you set the foundation for your season and it's not how you win your league it's how you set that foundation it's how you you know you can certainly lose your league at the draft so you want to be prepared uh learn more about that at ultimatedraftkit.com. i have a quick question for the day related to hard knocks which um is this the which lions player is going to get the biggest hard knocks bump in fantasy drafts it, you know we've had Season's gone by. Devontae Freeman, right, was standing yep, out in yep, a previous yep, yep. Atlanta Falcons hard knocks. So, you know, there's a number of draftable Lions. DeAndre Swift, who we'll talk about today. TJ Hawkinson, a sixth-round pick. Amon Ross St. Brown. Uh, Jameson Williams. Uh, you've got Jamal Williams and DJ Chark and, and Jared Garf. Jared Garf. <laughs> but... You know, I, I can't even answer this question because there really wasn't a player focus on the first episode. Yeah, I mean, the the reality is it's up to them to decide who they're going to focus on. You could make an argument that DJ Chark has the most room to bump up. He's going to be their primary wide receiver, and he's in the 13th round. But I don't think they're going to highlight him. He's not as good a story as someone like Amon Ross St. Brown, yeah. who I think they will end up highlighting. Um, and whoever they spend time with, they're going to show them doing well, and they will get a slight bump. So that, that'll that be my answer for now is Amon Ross St. Brown, get people hot and bothered off of the hot and bothery playoff finish that he had last year. There was one thing I was disturbed about from a perspective. I'm a, I, I root for the Lions. I like Dan Campbell. I like the story. I want to see them succeed. I know their fans. Look, as a Cardinal fan, you don't have a lot of success. You kind of relate to these teams that haven't had success. Mm -hmm. But I was, when Deuce Staley and Aaron Glenn would not stop yelling at each other, <laughs> like it was so over the top after a certain point where I was like, these two coaches, their defensive coordinator and their offensive guy, they're not even watching the plays anymore. Mm. They're just yelling at each other. So, um, yeah, I, it'll be interesting. Uh, Amon Ra makes sense as a player that could get a bump. I'd love them to feature DeAndre Swift, and, and, and I'd love to see more uh, about – their plans for him, but we'll find out soon enough. News and notes from around the league. Bucks wide receiver Russell Gage um, may have a left ankle or foot injury. There was news breaking this morning. Got the sleeper alert. Walking, but not too comfortably. Uh, it sounded somewhat concerning. Is there a chance that Julio Jones is <laughs> yes. really good for fantasy this year? Not yeah. like not like uh, uh, what AJ Brown was, or AJ Green was last year, uh, where he was a late round pick that turned out to be much better than where he was being drafted. But he was, for the most part, he wasn't winning people leagues or uh, you know a weekly player that you were starting. There were just opportunities uh, that he came through with. But is Julio Jones, a, you know, the opportunity here to be thrown the ball by Tom Brady? as w literally one of the greatest wide receivers of all time, is there a chance at age 33 that he ends up with a really solid output? I don't think so. You Do you think it's possible he could be a wide receiver two in fantasy this year? Yeah, wide receiver two, sure. Yeah, it, it, I, I wasn't sure how high the bar you were setting. No, th but that's what I mean. If Because he, he's not being drafted like a wide receiver. I mean, he's at the back of drafts, so it's just an interesting... I Yeah, wide receiver two, sure. Yeah, with with the gauge, we, we, we'll monitor this information. Chris Godwin, we still – we won't know until week one, it seems like, is if Chris Godwin is ready to go, uh, which he may not be. And uh, so they're just – they're they're dropping like flies here in Tampa Bay, and Julio Jones is the last man standing. Cortland Sutton is working through a shoulder thing, mm -hmm. according to Nathaniel Hackett. Mm -hmm. Work work faster. Um. So we'll see how serious that turns out to be. And then another report about the Steelers coming out of uh, The Athletic, looking to lighten Najee Harris's workload in some capacity. Yeah, we, we've kind of heard that all off season. But the, Mike made the point in an earlier episode, that can just mean he could have similar touches yes. and fewer snaps, right? You could have yep. plays where you put other running backs out there to look good and give him uh, some time on the sideline, but then the, the opportunities are still obviously going to be in Najee Harris's 
favor. He's our consensus RB8. We talked about him on yesterday's show. So unless some other news came across the wire this morning, Mr. Giamatti. Nothing. Okay. Then we'll move on. Running backs. On yesterday's show, Jonathan Taylor, number one, Christian McCaffrey, Austin Eckler, Derrick Henry, Dalvin Cook, Alvin Kamara, Joe Mixon, Najee Harris, Homer pick James Conner, and then Aaron Jones. I heard a lot of the Homer pick James Conner. That's fine. Uh, Zeke coming in at number 11. 27 years old. Quite a disparity between the three of us. Mike and I have him at eight. Uh, Jason has him at 15. He's being drafted closer to that range as the RB13. It's why he's one of my favorite picks this year. Um, he finished as the RB6 last year. It was a bumpier road because he wasn't giving you league winning or should I say week winning performances from basically the bye week on. You only had one top 10 finish for a running back that finished RB6. There was the injury concern. Um, you know, it's a PCL injury. And according to our injury expert, Matthew Betts, they usually do well without surgery after a full off season of recovery. That's what he's coming back from. That's what, you know, the believers want to attribute the down year to. And, um, you know, I do believe that Zeke is a cornerstone piece of the Cowboys. That's really my whole argument. Is he still a cornerstone? If he's a cornerstone, he'll still be productive. And um, that's kind of where I weigh in right now. Well, for me, it's – I mean, look at the beginning of the season. Yeah, week one was an absolute disaster. That was against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Very, very strong against the run, and it's week one. Like, crazy stuff happens in week one. And then he rattled off RB8, RB1, 6-6, six, six, and then – and I think it was week four or five, that's when the injury happened. And that's when the the turn started to happen for Ezekiel Elliott. We saw the rushing yards basically have from right around 87 a game down to 43. But like he played the rest of the season. It, it was – he uh, like Andy was saying, he's so foundational to this team that even through the injury, they still said no – we're going to go with you as the primary back. It, while the the Twitter world is screaming for Tony Pollard, a hurt Ezekiel Elliott continued to play in front of him. Then you have what happened over this offseason. You had some very bloated contracts for the Dallas Cowboys, as Jerry Jones is one to do, and they had to make a decision. And that decision was, we trade Amari Cooper away, we keep Ezekiel Elliott here, and then you have all the, in, in training camp, the talking him up as, no, he's... He's the guy in this backfield yet again, and I, I'm ranking him there. Uh, I'm projecting that Ezekiel Elliott, he's, he's not a rookie. He's not a sophomore anymore. That's fine. He's not a top three running back. We don't have him ranked there. But I still think that volume-wise, offensive line, a really high-powered offense, I think that Ezekiel Elliott is a fantastic foundational fantasy football pick. Yeah, I, so I, I obviously have him the lowest, um, and I think Ezekiel Elliott is 100% a foundational back for this team. I don't for one second think Tony Pollard, halfway through the season, takes the job over for from Ezekiel Elliott. That This coaching staff and Jerry Jones, this is uh, Ezekiel Elliott's backfield that Tony Pollard gets to be a part of. My uh, ranking of, of him being a little bit lower is basically, the you know, last year, okay, the injury, We let's say yeah. that that was it and that was all of it and maybe I'm completely wrong. But that being said, he played the whole season, barely cracked a 1,000 yards, and you brought up the offensive line as a plus. I view it as a, as a negative. Not that they have a poor offensive line, but they certainly have a worse offensive line going into this year than they had last year. I think the offense as a whole, losing Amari Cooper, not having Gallup. I, this I just, do worry about the offensive line a little bit. This, I really do. to me, projects to be a worse offense, still a good one but a worse offense than last year's version of the Cowboys. Ezekiel Elliott is a little older, and if he doesn't miraculously get better this season than he was last season, then if he just takes a slight downturn and continues to be the volume king here, I think he'll be good, not great for fantasy. That's just how I view him. All right, Pro Football Focus, for what it's worth, Pro Football Focus back in June, at least, they still had the Cowboys ranked as the sixth best offensive line going into the season. I, I, I've read enough around camp that makes me question if they're going to be able to protect Dak and, and run block to the same degree. 
So rank before the season versus what people are seeing sure. right now on film. I don't know. I don't know what the truth is going to be there, but the fact that that's even a question, that's not been a question in Dallas for a long time. So I'm just, look, I haven't ranked where you do, but it, that would be a, a something to pay attention to. And I, I, I think, you know, Jason's argument about the offense being somewhat worse and opportunities in the red zone, it's a possibility as well. They are really, really hurting at the skill positions right now. Yeah. Because we don't know if CD has what it takes. And I shouldn't be reading stories about uh, Simi Fahoko and his big surprise at wide receiver being a potential impact player. Um, because right now, Michael Gallup's not going to be ready. Right. So I, I don't know. I, I, I think that there is. It, the reason I like it is because you get 300 opportunities. Yeah, we, How do you get 300 opportunities in the third round as for a, a player that's been a top five player? As a group, the three of us are all, all about where Ezekiel Elliott is being drafted right now because he's being he's being drafted like someone that... He's in the dead zone. You don't want to be left holding the bag. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we talk about that when those players age out and then all of a sudden they're worthless. He's being drafted like people are afraid that that is a potential outcome. None of us think that that is, in, other than like season-ending injury, that is not a potential outcome here for this team. He's not going to be left for dead and overtaken. He will be the dude. He will have a ton of volume. So I think he's relatively safe. And he safe. may catch more passes with the lack of wide receiver sure. weapons. Um, I definitely am taking him over at James Conner. All right. Um, in the same range. Leonard Fournette at 12. I I just can't draft him. <laughs> I don't I'm not he's, he's the most ridiculous player. It feels so strange. And I know, look, Al Borland last year. Uh was it the the, the redraft league with Leonard yeah. Fournette? I mean, you yep. just rode great performance after great performance and every he was the kind of player that when I saw a cross for me in a fantasy lineup, I was like like, oh, phew. Thank goodness. <laughs> you know, I'm not facing Derrick Henry or Christian McCaffrey or somebody that's, like, going to beat me this week. And then he would beat me. And it didn't seem fair. Uh, but he was the RB3 from weeks 4 through 15. So I'm dumb. He's not. He's back in the fold. Got paid. Trusted by Tom Brady. And if it wasn't for the baggage that he holds from the previous multiple years of his career... I think we'd be looking at this situation completely, or I could look at it less emotionally. Yeah, it, it it is one of those things where his inefficiency and kind of the letdown, even on what he was drafted to originally be, always seems to play a factor in his weight coming in. There's a lot of reasons we don't want to like Leonard Fournette, but what we do know about him is three different times he's been a top 10 fantasy running back. We know that he is the primary pass catching back for this team literally today out of camp they said he's looking great in the passing game and you you know we know that when there are a bunch of vacated targets and changes at wide receiver it often goes to the running back position so I just was like oh could Julio really benefit from well maybe it's just Leonard Fournette again catching a million dump offs I feel pretty safe with him uh, at the back of the second round, the two-three turn. I still think he will just be so involved. This is going to be a great offense, and you know, I mean, he was the running back seven last year, and even better if you look at once he got the role that it seems going into the season, he's got a a pretty yeah. good grasp of right now. Yeah, I'm stupid. I'm I'm being very clear about this. I I should draft him. Well, you mayhem drafted for me in the mock draft this last week, and it was upsetting to my draft plan so I I totally get the uh where you are mentally with Leonard Fournette but he averaged five receptions a game he always has scoring upside because the the Buccaneers are going to be a high-powered offense with Tom Brady eight rushing touchdowns on only 180 attempts this past year like the question for and Ronald Jones is gone not that he was a factor for for the whole season but at the beginning of the year it was we didn't know. We didn't know is it going to be Ronald Jones? Is it going to be Fournette? And then Ronald Jones fumbled, and that was it. And it was now Leonard Fournette as the primary guy. They spent a a day two pick on Rashad White, who profiles as a pass catching running back, but he's still a rookie. Yeah, I mean, so, Ronald Jones so much more proven going into the year last year than Rashad White. Yeah, so I'm just I'm I'm trying to throw out like what could go wrong for Leonard Fournette. 
and what could go wrong is Rashad White is NFL ready, but we have seen so many times of a rookie or just a, a younger player makes a mistake, and Tom Brady looks over to the coaches and says, take him out of the game, put Leonard Fournette back in, because I don't want to play with that guy trying to protect me. So he's old. He's got a good amount of, of – uh, like he's – been used a lot so you, you you have a lot of opportunities that he's already taken on with with his body so it feels scary but I think at the end of the year he's going to be in that 90 target range again and with huge touchdown upside so yeah I mean it's it, it's the smart move I think it's the smart move to draft him Keyshawn Vaughn was a higher draft pick than Rashad White people spent years dreaming sure. of uh, he's the example right he's the yes, example of the exactly. promising rookie that why would you like it's not like they weren't super successful with Lenny, so yeah. Roster watches at camp today. They just tweeted 55 minutes ago, as of this recording, that on <laughs> I can't believe I missed that. I cannot believe it. Don't worry um, about it. Thank you. Where are you uh, preseason form? Yeah, uh, and that that unsurprisingly, Rashad White has not yet uh, taken snaps with the first team, and he is being given the opportunity to try out in the kick return game. So he's he's not a massive worry for Leonard Fournette right now. DeAndre Swift comes in at 13. I think the most prolific snub, I would say, well, from the top ten yesterday. It's your guys' fault. I have a mate. Okay. All right. Uh, accept that. DeAndre Swift is a is being drafted as the running back eight right now. He was the RB nineteen last year due to injuries, and uh, we have him at thirteen. He's a great, talented running back. That is not a question. Like DeAndre Swift in a vacuum. Super talented, was my number one rookie coming out that year because of what we saw. And what we've seen in the NFL is is the same, right? He was the RB7 from weeks 1 through 11 last year. That's the story that people want to remember, and they see the upside of a player that has, you know, running game prowess and then the passing game efficiency to be an 80, 90 catch guy. Look, if that happens, he's going to well outperform this ranking. There are risks that you accept yes. when you are drafting a Detroit Lions running back. And some of those risks are built around what situation this team's going to be in. Um, I see the upset. I see the potential. Uh, so the, the nice thing about the situation that he's in is that when we've liked running backs in the past for the Lions, which I don't know if any of us ever have, <laughs> Um, <laughs> this one is a pass catching specialist. So if they're not doing well in some of these games, if they're down, then his skill set, which scores more fantasy points, could be used even higher. This is an Austin Eckler type of player where, you know, there's very, very few guys in the NFL, maybe, maybe five players that are the pass catcher that DeAndre Swift is, that, that are going to be involved in the passing game at running back quite as much. I mean, that's why CMC is going 101 or 102. That's mm -hmm. why Eckler is next off the board. So he is and should be a little bit game script proof. Also, speaking of offensive lines, this is, you know, PFF has them as a top three offensive line this sure. year. So I think the needle is pointing up. You worry about injuries because that's what you've seen. But you worry about that with everybody. So if you take injuries out and you just say, how should he perform when he's getting 100 or 90 targets, he should be a great fantasy asset in any half PPR or certainly full PPR league. Yeah, I mean, Jamal Williams yes. is a very capable third down back. That's not something that really factors into the Eckler comparison. So I think that's where there's a tier separation there. Yeah, but Jamal Williams, through those first 11 weeks, he missed he missed two games, but he was there for the majority of those eleven weeks when DeAndre Swift was the running back seven. Yeah, yeah, no question. But just speaking to the pass catching ability, he's going to be a forty catch guy. And it just like that was one of one of my takeaways from it's just a small one, but that that first episode of Hard Knocks, it is clear how uh, Guns Mahoney feels about Jamal Williams, like. That was shown several times in there of like just a, a brief conversation on the sideline of of him stretching, and Jamal Williams talking about the players uh, about getting ready. And Campbell's like, "I'm I'm not worried about you. I'm not worried about you at all." Like 
two hundred twenty nine opportunities last year for yeah. Jamal Williams, and some some of that is inflated for the games where DeAndre Sorry, Swift for DeAndre Swift. If when Swift misses, you know Jamal Williams is is a very capable player. We I have him. I have Swift ranked pretty close to his ADP, a little bit under. So it's not that I'm saying that DeAndre Swift is an absolute bust, but like the some of the the, the rushing metrics of of DeAndre Swift, like he, he versus Jamal Williams as just a as a runner, were not that great. Like Jamal Williams was was more efficient, but DeAndre Swift is so electric in the pass catching that that I'm fine taking him at his ADP, but I'm not like I'm I'm not real hot and bothered that I gotta get Swift on my team. DeAndre Swift can he finish a top three running back? No, I think he can. Yeah, I would say he could. I, I think I fall in that category. Which is again, you know, that's one of the qualifying factors for how you evaluate these picks is, you know, is there the possibility that you have a league winner sure. at running back? Nick Chubb, we'll talk about him in a minute. By the way, quick reminder for everybody out there before we talk about Nick Chubb, I don't know if we've mentioned it this off season, but fantasy football leagues you need some swag, you need a trophy. Absolutely. Make sure that you go to fantasychamps.com. All the trophies you could possibly need. I just ordered two more placards for our family league trophy from Fantasy Champs so that I can <clears throat> regrettably deliver it to the <laughs> champion. Take it out of my house. Go put it in their house. But um, great trophies. They kind of uh, they make an impact on the eyes, right? They, they, they're weighty and um, worthy of a champion. Yeah, I mean, if you are a champion, then you should have a trophy. That's like just uh, the way the world works. And if, I believe right now they're giving you a free ring. Yes, if you get a, any any trophy, add that to your cart, you can get their $60 ring, and you put the code free ring in on checkout, and you'll get that one for free. So 60 becomes zero. That is right. All right. So fantasychamps.com, check that out. Nick Chubb comes in at 14. That's exactly where Jason and I have him at 14, Mike at 16, uh, 26 years old. 1,259 yards on the ground, eight touchdowns, rarely used in the passing game, 20 catches on the year, finishes the RB11. Very fun player to watch play football when he's in a rhythm, when he's on, he's a, when he's he the is guy. A man. So, but, but has consistently been the player with the largest gap between NFL impact and fantasy impact at the running back position. Uh, I think he's kind of just known around the league. He's a top five talent at the running back position. But in fantasy, he's not that. Um, he has the ability to win you a week because when he hits, I mean, it, it's kind of comical. He did not have a fantasy finish that was between like 11 and 26. Yeah. <laughs> so he was three, 10, seven, three, four, seven, five, right? Those were the great weeks. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. You probably won because of Nick Chubb. And then it was, you know, 33, 27, 37, 41, 38, 41. And all indications are Kareem Hunt is going to be involved. And Kareem Hunt is not this player that they just lock into, you know, third down between the 20s. Or, you know, he, he can take goal line carries, uh, opportunities away. They can ping pong back and forth between these players. So Nick Chubb ends up in this weird category of fantasy running back where he's being drafted as the RB9, and it's just probably a little too too rich for my blood. Yeah, it makes complete sense. It's it's interesting bringing him up right after DeAndre Swift because Nick Chubb is such a better running back than DeAndre Swift in real life. But for fantasy purposes, he is nowhere near as good, and it all comes down to the pass catching at running back position. If you're not named Derrick Henry, you need to catch passes. Now, there's always a point where any running back will become valuable for fantasy. It's a matter of where he's being drafted. Right now in sleeper, average draft position, he's at the top of the second round. Yeah. Now that hasn't been happening on underdog. Uh, where I've been doing drafts uh, for you know a long time this offseason, I'm getting him sometimes middle of the third round. He falls a little bit later. And at that point, I think he's a great value because there's not other guys who have the talent. You know, we've are, you know we have seen him three years in a row, be a top 12 fantasy running back at the end of the year. There is value to Chubb, but because he doesn't catch the ball, he is not game script proof. He will be boom bust, 
And so you need to know that when you're drafting him. To me, he is someone that I would love to have as my RB2 when I have a stud wide receiver. That, I feel like I'm set up for success. Uh, I, I don't feel comfortable with him as my running back one solely because of the inconsistency of the fantasy finish on a weekly basis. Yep. All right. Uh, we did just get some. Breaking news. Sleeper alert. We lost another center in Tampa Bay. Oh, no. Yeah, you, just, you, you didn't get it yet? No, I didn't see that. Carted off. Leg injury. Uh, Robert Hainsey, who was the next man up after Ryan Jensen. He was the reason that it might be okay. Wow. Might not be okay. Yeah. Leonard Fournette <laughs> should you, still mean, catch that, passes. I'll say that's but, even more targets. Yeah, oh, man. That is brutal. All right, let's move on to Javante Williams, who comes in at 15 on our consensus running back rankings for 2022. He's 22 years old. He's so good. It's part of the excitement around Javante Williams. He's so good. Uh, if you look at second-year running backs in their age 22 season since 2000, the ones that saw at least 240 opportunities, which is what Javante had last year, they averaged 17.4 fantasy points per game. Uh, that would have been running back four last year. Uh, more than 65% of them were top five on a points per game basis. So the start to the career, the op you know what you see from Javante Williams. Look, I gotta I gotta admit something. That's starting to creep oh, in. That's okay. starting to creep in. All right, uh -oh. let's hear it. I think it's gonna work out. Yeah, oh, it, yeah. it is. Yeah. It is gonna work out. Yeah, yeah. I think it's gonna work out. The people love it, Andy. The more the more you know, we do this fantasy football thing over years, the more that these situations start to kind of reveal themselves. And this situation is screaming 50, 50 timeshare for about the first half of the year. And, um, and maybe a, ta uh, maybe a full takeover over the, over the back half of the year with Javante having that breakout potential. Now, look, I don't know how you weigh that with the draft capital. If you're going to be giving back some of your year, and having a player that's maybe not the RB13 where he's being drafted over the first half of the year. But I think it's going to work out for Javante Williams, and I think that the changing of the guard will happen. And and I don't know how fast. I don't know if it's going to be a, you know, we've seen it in years past. It's it's It can be the the Doug Martin three-touchdown week. Like, does Javante go out there in week seven and, and have two 60-plus yard runs, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, this is the guy that's going to get 70-30. I don't know. I don't know how it will happen, but I think it will happen. Yeah, I mean, the reality is what you're doing when you draft Javante Williams is you're betting on talent. Uh, he is exceptionally talented. He can catch the ball. He is a phenomenal runner. He's part of now a great offense. The touchdown scoring opportunities will be there. Last year, he was in a complete, identical 50-50 timeshare with Melvin Gordon, and he finished as the running back 17 as a rookie. He's coming in this year as the leader. Now, Let's say it starts 50-50, which there's been reports all over the place from camp. Oh, it's going to be 70-30. Right. Javante, no, it's 55-45. Uh, oh, Melvin Gordon's very involved. The reality is Melvin Gordon's a good back. He will be involved. Javante Williams is their special NFL player entering his prime on a great offense who will be very, very good. Oh. He will be better than his rookie year where he was the running back 17. There are very, very few players in fantasy football who have that top three upside. Should something happen to Melvin Gordon or should Javante just be handed the reins at some point this season? He is that talented. So I don't have any problem making that hardcore bet. Look, 11 twelfths out of every league, is going to lose your league. You don't win every year. One person wins, and the person who wins is the guy who got the most talented, crazy breakout players. They got Cooper Cup. They got Jonathan Taylor. They ended up with those awesome, super talented players, and Javante Williams is one of those super talented players. I got a comparison for you. Okay. And maybe it's, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a poor one. You can tell me. I'll be the judge. David Johnson, Chris Johnson in Arizona. Okay. Oh, I like that. Talent. Veteran. That situation is similar to me where, you know, David Johnson wasn't going to – his breakout season, he wasn't being drafted, you know, to a top 10 running back. Um, you know, we saw him in his rookie season have opportunities, 
but he was stifled by a veteran Chris Johnson the way that Melvin Gordon – look, Melvin is not taking away from – And Hel was Ellington in front of him that year too? Yeah, they were all involved. And in, at the end of the day, you know, eventually somebody takes over. And, and you have to ask yourself, can Javante Williams be a takeover back? And I think the answer is yes. I think he can do things in a game that make you say he has to be out there all the time. So, again, that's he can do that. That doesn't mean he will. Otherwise, he'd be drafted as RB2 right now. He's being drafted to RB13 because of the, the ambiguity. But Jason's right. You try to win your league. Certain players fit that mold. Swift fits that mold to me. Williams fits that mold to me. The the nice thing for me about And Javon the price is not bad. That's exactly like where we are starting this year with Javante Williams. I like we're looking at the the sleeper ADP, you know, back of the second, RB13. I mean, we we just talked about Nick Chubb being drafted at the top of the second going as the running back 9 and we're all we all prefer Javante Williams. So the, the price is not outrageous in your draft and while the reports of the timeshare are kind of all over the place, what is consistent is Javante is the starter. Like, we we weren't at that place heading into the season last year. Was, Melvin Gordon was the leader. Javante Williams kind of had to earn his role and and be, work his way into that 50-50 timeshare. So I I think that we're starting in a place of power. The ADP is perfectly fine to me. So I, I'm all in on Javante Williams at that draft cost. Saquon Barkley at 16. Oh, man. This Still just 25 <laughs> years old. This, this is the terrifying one. Being drafted higher than where we have him. And um, I know we've all risen a little bit on the prospects of Saquon Barkley over the offseason. But it's tough. It's really tough. The Giants, you know, I just saw a chart yesterday. Mike shared it with the turnover at the top of the division in the NFC East. Here's how it goes, though. It's like. You know, Commanders, Eagles, Cowboys, Commanders, Cowboys, Eagles, Commanders. There's never a Giants yeah, name. Someone's missing there. And the Giants have been, you know, they there's always promise in the offseason. Head coaching changes, free agent acquisitions. Kenny Galladay was once a heralded free agent acquisition who is now, as far as I'm concerned, not being drafted anywhere. Yeah. I mean, being drafted late. So I don't want to, you know, live in this world of promise with the Giants without being a realist. But Saquon should get every opportunity. That's a big part of it. The second piece of interest is Brian Dable coming in. Mm, yes. Can they take a step forward on the offensive side of the ball? That's the end of my list. I don't I don't think that there's a compelling case for Daniel Jones being a help in this situation. I I don't mind that that take at all. And also look at the depth chart. Like right now behind him is Matt Burita, which I guess he showed he still has some juice last year for the Buffalo Bills. He's got a, enough to be like a Devontae Booker juice. Yeah, I, I think at this point, I, I, like Booker would be more of a scary backup to me than than Matt Burita. And look at the way the season unfolded. For we, when you remember the season in totality for Saquon Barkley, it's oh, it was an absolute bust of a season. He just keeps getting hurt all the time, and it was a slow start. The guy was coming off a catastrophic knee injury. We weren't even sure he would be ready for week one. They ease him in, and then week three, running back 10. Week four, running back three against the New Orleans Saints, who were a fantastic defense that year. And then the very next game, he has the really unfortunate, he's walking backwards, and rolls his ankle on uh, stepping on someone else's foot, very much like a basketball injury. The thing ballooned up immediately. He misses four games, comes back, still getting great volume, not terrific for fantasy football. But I mean, he's playing on a uh, on an ankle on a busted ankle. Like it's very difficult for these running backs when if they receive that ankle sprain to come back and be really effective. So, uh, uh, like I said, he is Saquon Barkley terrifies me. Because we are lower than consensus. Uh, the guy has the ability to score from anywhere on the field. Catch passes. It, 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 he's a pass catching running back. Should see true three down running back usage. But I, I Jason, what's his can't downside? What, what, what is the, what's the floor for Saquon outside of injury? The floor outside of injury is that he is an inefficient uh, running back too. 
So uh, okay. I think that that's the floor. I think the ceiling exists for him to be a top 10 running back. But we, I always, I've said this for a couple of years when we were, you know, prior to the injuries, when we were dealing with um, the lore of his rookie season, comes in yeah. as a rookie and is the number two running back in fantasy football with Eli Manning catching uh, 91 receptions on 121 targets. He has that ability, but that doesn't mean that he's in the system or going to be used in that way. Now, he's a three-down back because of this depth chart. He's only 25 years old, so I do, like unlike, unlike Zeke, where I think you know the inefficiency was all the injury and now he should be good, with Saquon, I do think he's healthy. I think he should be back to full strength. But that doesn't mean you're ever going to get what you got that rookie year with Eli Manning checking it down 121 times. His his sophomore year, he was only the running back 10, even though you know he was healthy most of that. And four of his best games came in the four starts with Eli Manning that year. So my point is, I think Saquon is back, is healthy, is a three-down workhorse back. But I don't think he's going to be involved in the passing game like he was in the lore days of... Saquon Barkley should sure. be the first or second pick off the board. I view him about where we have him ranked, um, which is a very good running back, you know, a, a, a high-end running back too. But with this offense, with Daniel Jones, um, I I don't think he is, you know, we say, does he have the, does he have top three upside? And I think a lot of people would say yes, and I would not. We okay, do, that's fair. We do have a slight update here. On uh, Robert Hainsey, the the center from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, apparently he's fine, just a cramp. <laughs> oh my god! Well, come on now. Oh, got, all right, <laughs> got carted off. Wow, that's some cramp. He just needed an IV or something. I don't know. I wish I could get carted off if I ever get a cramp on the pickleball courts. Where's my cart, Al? But, but where do they cart you to on the? <laughs> they cart just you cart to you the just side to the, the side. Yeah. yeah, four feet. You betcha. <laughs> They were I had a major cramp on the pickleball court, and I've never seen a person less equipped to help me than Al Borland. That man doesn't know what to do to help a man with a cramp. Well, what are you supposed what to, do? to do? What do you do? Do you need me to massage you? Do you like I mean, a, you got to stretch. I need somebody to stretch the the calf cramp out. How does he stretch your calf? He was well, screaming so at been, me to straighten his leg out, and yeah. I, apparently I was doing it wrong. Yeah. Oh, weird. Mm -hmm. Okay. I had a Theragun. I was ready. Don't tell you me did, I wasn't. You did run and get the Theragun. Thank okay. goodness you had that. Excellent work, Al. Sounds, Thank you. After like well 30 equipped. minutes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, number 17 and 18, David Montgomery, Josh Jacobs. I feel like every offseason people want to create a reason to not like David Montgomery. I don't know why, but I like it for his draft price because when he plays, he's great. You know, he's not, he's not a top 12 guy for this season, but he's going to be a very consistent producer for your team. He's going to get a ton of work. And... Um, Look, to me, it's not much different than Saquon Barkley. Like, you are on an offense that you don't have confidence in, uh, but you're seven spots lower in draft costs for David Montgomery. Like, I don't... I have so, so much more confidence in the Giants' offense and their pieces and their coaching than the current Bears who have no one to throw the ball to. And, uh, you know, it's it, you, you also have a, a depth chart here where I do think it is... David Montgomery. I, I, I think he is the the clear lead. But I think this is a new coaching staff. They've talked up Khalil Herbert. And what we've seen, like, with we, we have the evidence. Khalil Herbert's a very good running back. If they do involve him, then he'll stay involved more, to a slightly higher degree than what David Montgomery has had the last two years as far as competition. So in this really, really bad offense, if he loses... 10%, 10 of his workload. Doesn't that just kind of take the shine off of, you know, he's, he hasn't been otherworldly. No, he's just been good. He's outperformed his AB, ADP on the on the reg. Uh, I don't really see it being much different from a talent perspective than Dalvin Cook and Alexander Madison. Alexander Madison gets talked about every offseason for how talented he is. Khalil Herbert is very talented, but at least the evidence we've seen on the field is that Montgomery is superior. In, in every way. And so, again, uh, he's at 17. He's at 16 on my rankings. You have him at 18. So we're not really – like the case for David Montgomery is you get to spend maybe a fourth-round pick on somebody that's going to get 300 touches 
in the offense that has been the RB2 in the crucial weeks of the fantasy season, two consecutive years. Um, weeks 13 through 17, he was the RB2 in 2020. He was the RB2 last year in that stretch. So, you know, everyone was afraid when he came back that Khalil Herbert was going to resume his dominance, and it, it was not that. It, it was not that, but uh, that's Matt Nagy, you know, the completely different regime. So, like, it, the – the probability is that David Montgomery is the by far the leader of the timeshare, but I, I David Montgomery is not someone I'll be drafting. I have him, I have him at running back twenty one versus his ADP of eighteen, so it's not that far off. But it's the opportunity cost to me of where he is going. Like I think he's a lower tier running back, and there's high tier wide receivers in my projections there. So it's. The, it's not. I don't think David Montgomery is useful for a team. I just I think that the way that the draft is falling, he won't be on my roster. Jacobs. There have been you know negative vibes around Josh Jacobs all off season. Trade rumors. People want to be in on Zamir White. He didn't get his fifth year option picked up. Correct. Uh, he's still just twenty four years old and been extremely productive. Looked good again in preseason so far. Is he being undervalued? He's being drafted at RB22. It's almost a fifth-round pick. People are like hands-off with Josh Jacobs. Is there opportunity there for for upside? There's definitely opportunity for him to outperform his ADP of running back 22. I mean, he is a young, talented uh, you know, back that was a first-round draft pick and has been good in his career with – an offense that should be better. I, I do think that there's – I mean, he's being drafted as the running back 22. He's never he's never finished that low. He's been the running back 18, 8, and 14. The offense is better. The issue I have is the – and we've talked about this uh, over the last couple of weeks. The way that I find myself building my teams in fantasy football this year is I'm getting my running backs out of the way early because I love the wide receivers in this range where he's being drafted – and I, I I prefer my roster when I've got the stud wide receivers in this range and the stud running backs in the first three rounds or especially the first two rounds range versus the opposite, where I get those stud wide receivers and then I end up with Josh Jacobs, who absolutely could outperform his ADP and should outperform running back 22. The issue is, to what degree? Running back 16? 15? Would you be happy with that? You You beat the ADP. He was a quote value pick but I don't see him being a dominant fantasy football asset the way that wide receivers in this range actually could come through as a dominant wide receiver asset I do think it's a little deceptive when we go to the arguments about beating ADP because mm -hmm. what generally happens when you beat ADP is you have I mean every season you're going to have five or six guys drafted ahead of somebody that get hurt and so beating ADP is a it, you factor in almost like survival, like beating ADP means you just didn't get hurt because if everybody ahead of you didn't get hurt, you wouldn't have beat your ADP. Does that make sense? Uh huh. Sometimes it's just not a meaningful statistic for your fantasy team to win. Well, and sometimes you beat your ADP, but it's still with irrelevance. Like, okay, you finished as the running back 18, you were drafted as the running back 22, but you weren't really happy about that. I remember back in the day, uh, you know, with, uh, Trey boo boo, <laughs> Trey Burton. Trey Burton. Yeah. Um, he beat his ADP. He finished as like the the tight end seven, but it was irrelevant. Yeah, but, and and you're not drafting players to be ADP ever. You're really not. You're not drafting them to finish at ADP. You're drafting them to be better. Yeah. You're trying to find the player that's going to outperform. So Jacobs does have a little bit of those th those questions, but again, it's interesting. You know, we're in the category Saquon, new offensive system, Montgomery, new coaching staff, Jacobs, new coaching staff. So. There are some questions. It's not only a new coaching staff, but it's a new coaching staff that for years has uh, – it's Josh McDaniels coming from the New England Patriots, and they've been incredibly frustrating with their running back usage for fantasy football. So that's, that's my biggest concern here mm -hmm. is they came in, they said we're not going to commit to Josh Jacobs because of the fifth-year option. They're, we're going to bring in a whole bunch of running backs, so including like, Brandon Bolden over yes. from the the Patriots. And it's, so, maybe by the time we get to you know the home league are really going, drafts are really firing at the end of August. Maybe we have some more clarity to this running back room. 
But as of right now, you got Jacobs, Brandon Bolden, Zamir White, Kenyon Drake, like Amir Abdullah, who was being used sure. in that preseason no, that's game a fair as point. well. So it will if they have four active running backs on game day, you're going to be ripping your hair out. Now, unfortunately, uh, as we move forward here, uh, Jason's already got his running back, so he's not going to be able to draft this guy. But Brees Hall comes in at 19, Brees Lightning. The RB19 is exactly what he's being drafted as. That's where we have him ranked. Jason is the highest at 16. I'm at 21. Mike's at 23. I said quietly in the office the other day to Jason that you know I'm coming around on Brees Hall's upside. Uh, I still think that it's it's a tough situation. Uh, this is a team that has a gauntlet for the first nine weeks. I, I think your odds of being happy with Brees Hall, I mean truly happy with Brees Hall those first nine weeks, are your odds are below 50%. I would say that you are correct that the odds of being happy to come out the gate in the season and be really, really happy being able to rely on Brees Hall are not good. The odds at the end of the season that you look back, if you held on to your draft pick of Brees Hall and say, man, what a great draft pick. I think are very, very high. Right now, he's being drafted at what I think is is near his floor, you know, a low-end RB2. He was uh, the 16th player on the Jets board. They tried to trade up into the first round. They couldn't, so they were still able to trade up to get him. He, they wanted him as part of the plan. He checks every single box from a, a incoming college athlete. He was unfathomably productive. You you don't get better production. He was young. He uh, he is young. Um, was and is was and is <laughs> one and the same. A little less but, young now. Yeah, you're not than, always than young. before. Um, and he, his athletic profile is off the charts. I I love his film. I love his analytics. So there's really the only thing I don't like about. Brees Hall is that there is a murky situation where we're not 100% sure of his utilization and he's on a poor offense but rookie running backs do well like rookie running backs are a good bet in fantasy football uh, on average there's two rookie running backs every year that finishes a top 24 back I can't imagine putting someone else ahead of Brees Hall in the rookie running back to finish higher and oftentimes they are RB1s I think when I'm looking at Josh Jacobs or Brees Hall like okay there's there's ways for both to be good, but one of these players, I think, could come in and be a superstar. That is not without the realm of possibility for me. I don't see Josh Jacobs breaking off 80-yard touchdown runs, and I see Brees Hall doing that a couple times this year. And You're going to be happy uh, whenever those plays happen, so I just love the talent. I'm betting on the player, uh, but there are certainly fears named Zach Wilson. Yeah, my, my 31st biggest... in offensive plays per game last year with Wilson in there. My that pace of play is a big concern and targets to the running back position. You have to like Michael Carter had a stretch where it was awesome for fantasy football. Zach Wilson was not the one throwing him that ball. Like uh, when he had those huge target spikes, that was other players like Mike White coming in off of the bench. And and now like you have the second year of Elijah Moore. They spend a real high draft capital pick on Garrett Wilson to be a superstar wide receiver in their in their hopes like it will Zach Wilson utilize the running backs in the passing game enough or is Brees Hall going to be seeing two to three receptions like that, that that's what Michael Carter was doing at the beginning of the year was Zach Wilson was and Michael Carter still there to absorb some yeah, receptions yeah like Michael Carter like, it's not like they're not going to throw Michael Carter the football he was great at it I I Side more with Jason that like Michael Carter doesn't freak me out from Brees Hall. Like I think Brees Hall will be the guy over Michael Carter, essentially week one. My, yes, Michael Carter will be involved, but at the beginning of the year, I mean two targets, three, 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 three targets, and then you see the big spike because Zach Wilson was was out. So that that's my biggest concern is just is he one of those quarterbacks that that refuses to check down? Yeah, I mean I think that there's some things being lost in that analysis because Michael Carter was a rookie too. So like his opportunities grew over the course of the season and his involvement did. And so will that will happen with Brees Hall as well. Like that's the goal, right? You hope that you get that. Like he, you may have a rookie season very similar to Josh Jacobs in, in Oakland at the time mm -hmm. where he finished at RB 18. He was involved. He wasn't as good as you wanted him to be um, because there's some hurdles on the offense and the team, but it should be interesting. Oh no. 
Well, I mean, I, we're, oh, we're yeah. wrapping it up. Antonio Gibson. All right. All right. An old 24 years old, Antonio Gibson. <laughs> uh, he gets the music because Mike is the lowest in the office. Yeah. Oh, man. Mike doesn't even want to put him in the top 24. Oh. I don't really know how that happened. Not really sure. Low, low stats, bad production. This is a sad day. I'm just, I'm not sure what scoring format we're looking yeah, at. Yeah, we're looking at half PPR. It's what we always look at. Huh. Okay. So, um, your champion. I remember him. Yeah. I remember yeah. him fondly. I look forward to Antonio Gibson making us all look real stupid. I'd like that. For I, doubting him. I would like that. I think, unlikely. I think it is unlikely. Un- un- yeah, unlikely. Um, you know, a- Antonio Gibson, <laughs> what has he done? He's a great, prolific uh, athlete who, who uh, has only finished as a running back one so far in his. Uh, and to the garbage. <laughs> two, two years. Uh, two top 12 fantasy football finishes and to the garbage heap he goes. The reality is with Antonio Gibson, with J.D. McKissick on the roster, he's not the pass catcher we want him to be, that I think he could be. Uh, with Brian Robinson Jr. drafted on as a day two pick, yeah. he's going to be involved. So he's going to take some of the short yardage, the goal line stuff away. Antonio Gibson. The fumble downs, as, as Gibson yeah. called. He called them the fumble downs. Yeah, he, he had six fumble downs last year, Antonio mm. Gibson did. That is... About at least five too many, and so they drafted the <laughs> anti Gibson, the un super athletic guy who never fumbles the ball. Antonio Gibson will still be involved. He will be used. He will have good fantasy days because he's a a great athlete, uh, and and he will score touchdowns. He's not going to disappear. But the the reality is he's not the pass catcher. He's not the only goal line guy. So he is part of a three headed timeshare where the two big upside opportunities neither one does he have a stranglehold on and so i just don't see the route for me loving him on my roster you called it the lore of saquon barkley i think the lore of antonio gibson was that that you had top five potential and i think we're retiring that and that's fine but i mean so out of the realm of possibility for you guys is top 15 in his range of outcomes I, I wouldn't say that's top 12. out of the range. I don't think I mean, he's going to be a top 12 running back. I've, uh, yeah, I would agree with that. I've got him at running back 19. So this isn't a dead, unusable fantasy asset. So, but uh, for but a guy, the, the risk is that it goes the other direction. Sure. That's part of the risk with Gibson and why he's ranked where he's at. Is not so much that he can't still contribute and be a, a dominant force on certain weeks. It's that you could also have potentially the RB34, the RB31. Something happens where you, you have – like they brought JD McKissick back. It wasn't just he's still on the roster. It was like they brought him back to yep. do what he does. And then they went out and got Robinson. So your range of outcomes on Gibson is why you're seeing him trickle down draft boards. Yeah, I I don't disagree that it, we, we may have seen the best from Antonio Gibson, but on the field, home run hitter, Brian Robinson, not a home run hitter. Like that's you're not going to give he loves singles. Yeah, you're 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 not giving Brian Robinson the ball at the 25, and him going to scamper off for us. He can get to the 24 though. <laughs> and I I think Robinson is is a good player, but what Antonio Gibson brings to the offense is is just different. And this is it's very concerning because I agree that by the end of the year, he could have fumbled away his his opportunity, and he gets replaced. But if he can hold on to the ball. Then I would expect you'll have you'll easily have another top twenty season for Gibson with with a with huge upside for a guy that can score fifty plus yard touchdowns. But will you get a victory lap from Mike Wright at that point? Of course. Okay. <laughs> uh, that wraps up top twenty. I mean, I'm t- I'm 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 frankly exhausted from all the Antonio Gibson victory laps that I've already run over the last couple of years. Um. Yeah, I you know I don't know if those were warranted, were they? What I think, was anybody out there like with you, like uh, watching you do the run, or were you running by yourself? Oh, oh, I had to run by myself because I was the, nobody attended. I was the leader. No, he he's been very good. <laughs> um, it's come in ways I think that have been less predictable. Right. So like the production, the end of the year, the 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 touchdowns. The, right. Rookie year, it was all it, touchdowns. It was like, wait, what's happening? How last, is he still getting there without the Christian McCaffrey year? Yeah, last year, the first 10 weeks, he was only the running back 19 mm-hmm. because J.D. McKissick was there. J.D. McKissick went out week 12, and then all of a sudden, Gibson's targets skyrocketed. So, I mean, the, the, the way it goes right for Gibson is because he's so talented, an injury to one of the other two backs, now he's, 
He's back to relevant. Let me set the record straight. Mike is not the lowest in the office. Those were Thank missed. You. Thank you. Mistyped numbers. Oh, but it made for a good moment. So yeah, uh, that's on that's on Kyle. Um, the next four, real quick: Cordero Patterson, Travis Etienne, Chase Edmonds, Rashad Penny. Uh, the initial depth chart in Miami. I mean, I know it doesn't matter, but it is co-starters: Chase Edmonds, Raheem Mostert, right now. Uh, other names in the top twenty f or top thirty for us: Clyde Edwards, Alaire at twenty-five, Hunt at twenty-six, AJ Dillon. At 27, Cam Akers at wow. 28, Cam Elijah Akers Mitchell's 28 at 29, us. and then J.K. Dobbins at 30. That definitely feels too low. Are you y'all wilding? I, I on think your Cam Akers. Ranking. I still think I think Henderson's going to be quite involved. I don't I think agree. it's going to be the Cam Akers show the way that it was in the playoffs when Henderson wasn't there. But I do think 28 seems if that feels too low because he is the one out of the one-two punch for him and Daryl Henderson for a great Sean McVay led offense. So 28, I, I probably need to take. We call one. him the 1.2 punch. That's what his yards <laughs> per carry was. He does a 1.2. Uh, Elijah Mitchell 29, J.K. Dobbins at 30. Uh, Dobbins could certainly move uh, quickly if things yeah, are looking could. more promising. Same with Mitchell. Same with Acres. Uh, but if you want to see all the rankings, all of them, all the other positions. TheFantasyFootballers.com. Check them out. You want to see all the point projections? They're in the UDK at UltimateDraftKit.com. Tomorrow we're going to be talking some bounce back players, answering some questions. So if you have a question for us, you can dial the voicemail hotline three zero two four six four TFFB or click the submit a question button on the website. That'll do it for today's show. But there's always another one coming right around the bend, Mike. It never stops. Never stops, Ever. and we don't need it to stop. So make sure you're following along. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.